Yes, Dr. Darwala, how are you? Yes, I'm fine. Uh, Thank you. I, Wonderful I, to I see you. Anil Ji, good evening, good morning. I, I Where remember, you are? Good morning, I Devasikar. How are you? Dr. Chaman Nahal so well. Uh, I know, I know. I remember meeting you in my childhood. Yes. So and I'm he, honored to would, be on the panel with you. He would sometimes call me even in his uh, lecture rooms when I ah. talk, to the, <laughs> talk to the students and, and with him on the chair, in the chair, of course. Yes, I, I, I remember. He highly respected you. Yes. Good evening, all of you. Professor Vishweshwar Rao here. Sir, good evening. I welcome you all on behalf of Usman University Center for International Programs, OUCAP, former ASRC. This is Dr. Nageshwar Konda, the director, OUCAP. On behalf of my center and behalf of Usman University, and very happy to see you all of you, sir. Uh, Debashish Lahari, the chairman, Inspired Arts Foundation, is here. And I welcome you, sir, KK Saab, Anita Nahal, ma'am. Uh, Vishweshwar Rao sir and all other dignitaries welcome you all to this uh, uh, prestigious August gathering. Thank you Dr. Nageshwar Rao. Very kind of you. Thank you so much. Thank you ma'am. Uh, Anita ji, uh, shall we test the uh, screen sharing portion? Sure. Yes. Yes. Uh, Samuel, if you are here. Samuel, if you could uh, just try sharing the screen and just see if it works with Anita Ji's uh, PowerPoint. Yes. Yes, oh, Samuel. It's visible. <laughs> That's Mr. Chahal, the well-known Azadi novel and novel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It, yeah, it was perfectly visible. Thank you so much. It was clear. So, Kekiji, how are things in Delhi these days? Uh, the COVID yes, situation has improved? Delhi. I'm in Delhi. I have been here for a year and a half, not stirred out of Delhi. And uh, is, is, is Delhi better in terms of the COVID situation now? COVID situation is slightly better, but the, um, the, the pollution is pretty strong still. Uh, after Diwali, it always happens, and the farm, farm, uh, the the yeah, burning, the farms that they set, yes. double burning. But yes. now it has lessened. Now it is almost tolerable. Oh, good, good. That is very nice to know. Anita ji, it must be very uh, early in the morning where you are. Uh, it's about nine o'clock, just before nine a.m. Okay, okay. So it's it's pretty much okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you for doing this time and making it uh, more easy for me to join. <laughs> because we had to, we had to, uh, of course, because of the time zones, we had to adjust. Thank you. So it was so good that you could join us today. I am I am honored for the invitation and to be on a panel with Dr. Daruwala. It's my honor and with your university. So thank you so much. It's so good we could pull it off. Thank you so much. It's still it's still not too cold here, but we are oh. yeah, we're getting towards before Christmas there might be snow. Oh it's snowed, yeah. Yesterday it snowed about ten inches in some of the upper mountain areas, but not in the city. So we are very close to New York City. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's winter is still far away in Calcutta. It's uh, very far away in Calcutta. It's been uh, pretty unseasonal rains uh, for the last few days, five to six days. Uh, 
the weather has been quite bad damp mm-hmm. but warmish warmish uh, so is so, it's so uh, i mean the news uh, channels are agog with the fact that uh, probably the winter is going to make an entry on monday sunday or monday oh okay perhaps, perhaps. but then again and what and the winter is dry or is it it is a dry, dry? season it is a dry season winter is a dry season here yes it is but the problem Because in india is our east coast of- gets a lot of rain in the winter uh, you know places like okay. uh, orissa and uh, telangana area and of course uh, down Are south you- Tamil where is doctor where is doctor anita nehal are you in calcutta or in bombay in delhi uh dr darawala i am in the us oh you are in the us of course. yes of course. i i heard about it yes yeah. <laughs> no no worries no worries we used to live uh, near washington dc okay. but currently for some time we are living in new jersey new jersey yeah. right the audio has gone uh nahi i think it's here aap delhi mein hai na dr darwala lal it's a lal before the storm no it seems like that though <laughs> that those are the subheadings of the novel azadi uh, usme lal storm aftermath those were the three subheadings in the novel <laughs> i'm i'm going to talk about my my novel on the partition okay wonderful look forward to hearing it uh great after that i wrote another novel uh where is it the 5 minutes for the zero uh uh keki ji uh, our technical guy samuel tells me that uh, could you just uh, keep your head a little raised he says there's a problem with the framing uh i am not uh, actually the uh, person who is actually very conversant with the parlance but he says for a perfect framing you need to just raise your head a little bit so that the camera can focus on your face i hope uh, that's uh, i'm right samuel and i have been able to guide keki ji so i hope i don't have to fiddle with the uh, laptop no i i think you just have to sit up a little sir i think that's what he means what what do i need to do so just raise your head a little bit sit a little straighter i think that's what he's trying to say okay okay but my my room looks dark compared to all of you i don't know how i have i've got numerous lights I switch them off normally when I am on the laptop. Otherwise, eh, which place, am... sir? Can you switch on, sir? You are talking something, but Sorry? you have muted. Uh, yes. uh, uh, Doctor Dariwala, you have light behind you. Instead, Sorry. have the light in front of you so that your uh, your your frame will be better illuminated. Yeah, that's that's the best thing. And then and then. put the computer screen a little forward the laptops the computer the, screen a little a little forward so that again it's or, or raise up or raise up your head a little yeah that's better yeah sharmila deshmukh joined I don't know. Sometimes it uh, on these uh, Zoom 
and webinar, uh, I come out rather well. Debashish is very well lighted and very well lit, but <laughs> I'm in the dark. I always am. <laughs> um, but but not what you speak and what you write. <laughs> Uh, Kunda sir, it's just Light about two minutes. Mile kitchen. Ah, uh, ji. Yeah, we are just about two minutes uh, to seven thirty. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, my yeah. Uh, Shamil, can you test? Is it okay? Shall we start? Yeah, wale. Ha, theek hai. Is that any better or no? No, I think I'm well. I have about 25 minutes to myself. Am I right, Devashish? No. Yes, Kiki ji. Uh, you can even take 30, 30 to 35. No problem, sir. OK, OK, thank you. I still remember our seminar. Yes, Kekiji. It was also in December. It was also in December. Yes, that was in December. And which year? 2017 or? That's right. That's right. 2017, sir. Oh. 2017. Uh, you came in late at night. Remember, it was a memorable ride to yes. Ramakrishna Mission guest house. Yes. You know, the driver kept flouting all the traffic signals. You remember? Yes. yes. You were rather alarmed. Yes, I do remember. Yes, and we reached, I think, at 3 in the morning, if I'm not very mistaken. <laughs> yes, your flight from Goa was delayed, I remember. Okay. I, you were, I at, the, you were at the Goa Lit Fest. You were at, yeah, you were at the Goa Lit Fest. Yeah, it's a great moment. Uh, ji, shall we? Perfectly, Kunda sir, perfectly. Yes. A hearty welcome to all of you. A good evening to all of you. Uh, I am Dr. Nageshwar Konda, the director of OUCAP, formerly known as ASRC, American Studies Research Center. Now it is Usman University Center for International Programs. On behalf of the OUCAP, my sincere gratitude and welcome to the distinguished speakers of today's topic. Today, we are going to have the wonderful lectures, observations, insights on traumas up to date map, 75 years of the partition of India. For this, myself, I myself, and Debashish Lahari, Chairman, Inspired Arts Foundation. In fact, uh, Debashish Lahari is the main person who had taken initiation to take part in today's. Uh, gathering today's lecture series. 
and at the outset, uh, my sincere thankfulness to uh, Professor Keki Daruwala sir uh, for his active participation, his time, and his valuable presence with us. Thank you very much, sir. And I also, my sincere thanks to Anita Nahal, ma'am, for your presence in spite of your busy schedule. You are taking part in this. And my sincere thankfulness to Professor C.R. Special Rao, sir, a senior academician, chairman of Indian Society for Commonwealth Studies, who has been a backbone to the Usman University Center for International Programs. For a long time, whenever we conduct the programs, national, international event, Professor C. R. Vishveshwar Rao, his, his presence makes the gatherings very meaningful, memorable, his intellectual inputs. We never forget his intellectual inputs that he has shared his knowledge with the scholars of Usmania University and scholars across the country. Thank you very much, sir, for your participation, C. R. Vishveshwar Rao, sir. And Today, all we know that most of the participants, they watch the program on YouTube live and we have shared the link to very few participants and most of them, they can watch the program on YouTube live. As part of the discussion, uh, our speakers, they want to address traumas up to date to map, 75 years of the partition of India. Yes, in order to make in order to give just a view because my colleague the chairman inspire arts foundation is here and before giving before I hand over this proceedings to professor debash lahri our collaboration with inspire arts foundation it goes back to almost more than a year and dr debash lahri has been with us for conducting various national international programs Today, uh, because of his relentless efforts, this webinar, prestigious webinar, because the two important personalities are going to take part in this webinar uh, on basically partition literature. Most of the scholars of English arts and social sciences, they know partition literature usually deals with the, the depiction of the tragedy of partition a period in India's history, really, that is very hard to make sense of. It is an amalgamation of history, conflict studies, border studies, and politics. In fact, the multi layered dynamics of the partition of India, not only the political, but also it is its metaphoric and symbolic relevance and ramifications are remembered and revisited from multiple aspects in the partition literature. Its end goal is to go beyond the debunk when necessary, the standardized and narratives of India's partition that has been commemorated by the state. We, the scholars of the English literature and the other humanities, you know, the anguish, the, the sufferings, the emotional things related to the partition literature and the part in, in the year 1947, India not only got the independence and it was divided into two. The literature that talks about these aspects make the literature very meaningful. Many of scholars across the country, they read partition literature and they try to understand partition literature. I don't talk much because here the eminent personalities who can talk, who can share their valuable experiences with us, their writings, exhaustive reading and writings. And our mentor, Professor Sia Visveshwara sir is with us. And I don't want to take much of the time of the today's function. Now it's my honor to begin this session. And I would like to invite the chairman, Inspire Arts Foundation, Professor Debashish Lahari to hand over the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pondra Nageshwara Rao, Director of OUCIP, OUCIS in its latest avatar, Usmani University Center for International Studies. Thank you so much for agreeing to partner with the Inspirare Arts Foundation uh, 
in organizing this, this uh, very important, meaningful event, uh, the partition of India, 75 years of the partition of India is nigh. Uh, we're just on the cusp of uh, 2022. We are, uh, and this is something that has remained uh, an enduring subject for reflection. Uh, I was just having this conversation with uh, a colleague of mine a, a few weeks back, and uh, he was from the discipline of history. And he kept saying that uh, this uh, going back to issues like partition, like events, like uh, the raw wounds of partition, he said that we should get over it. Uh, he says that 75 years will soon be a 100 year old nation. Uh, uh, and he said that we should get over the, the hangover, that's the word he used, uh, uh, that we should get over it. Uh, and I said that. Uh, is it that easy? Uh, is, and, yes. and he said that. Well, he said, yeah, so, uh, but he said that uh, uh, we need to uh, get over it. Now, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure that that was the trigger yeah. about this event uh, that made me think about this event. But I think it played a very significant role in the way I started thinking about partition. Uh, because if that is a, a kind of a historian's take that we have had enough of it, that is exactly the question that we need to interrogate. That is the question we need to ask today, perhaps. Our eminent panelists, our eminent speakers today will obviously take that up as an issue. And I think that uh, we all will come to a conclusion that it is such a relevant still. It is the, the you might say, uh, the third rib of our nation. And uh, we just cannot do away with it just because uh, maybe uh, the politics of the time or maybe uh, just the fact that we have borne this burden for so long is, is, is you know, getting heavy on our backs. Um, I, I, KKG is here uh, with us very fortunately this evening. And uh, I, I'm actually uh, drawn to quote a couple of lines, the very first a couple of lines of his uh, wonderful poem, Partition Ghazal, where he says that this may pass muster and yet may not pass, this past we are talking of is not the past. That is certainly the key point that we should begin everything from, that this is not the past. This is not something in the hoary past that we are deliberately raking up for the sake of it. This is there very much so in the air we breathe, in the lives that we lead, in our families, it's still there. The, the seeds of this violence, the seeds of this trauma, the seeds uh, of those days, of those hor horrific days, those dark days, are still there in our family. I mean, in different ways, still. Uh, I, I, I can uh, obviously tell you stories of my family, and uh, not all family members, but some of them who had to face this, this trauma on the eastern uh, frontier. Uh, you know, the Noah Kali riots and all the other ugly details that. Uh, kind of jar in our mind even today. Uh, they are as much a reality as anything happening. And then again, uh, guises may have changed, faces may have changed, but facts have remained the same. Uh, communal divides, politics that surrounds it, uh, makes for a, a, a very sad uh, story indeed uh, in, in, in India, even in the present day India. So we are never far away from partition. Uh, the wounds of partition, the lines opened up. And I think the, the most uh, uh, extraordinary thing for me uh, growing up as a child was to know about this idea of the Radcliffe line, that someone somewhere could draw a line on a piece of paper on a map. And uh, that could spell this amount of hatred, this amount of shedding of blood, this amount of outrage, this amount of uh, just lives uprooted. People do not know where to go. When you come home, you're actually homeless. Um, I, just, I just did not understand how the casual drawing of a line on a piece of paper would actually you know, you know, you know, divide a subcontinent and, you know, and, and sunder so many people, uh, take so many lives. Uh, so again, the, the, the sheer callousness of this uh, cartographic gesture and the uh, the uh, it is, it is quite extraordinary. Uh, so to tell us more uh, about all of that 
uh, and, and more. Uh, we have two brilliant uh, practitioners of the art of writing in India. Uh, we have Kiki Darwal, of course, and we have Anita Nahar, who, in addition to being a professor of history and a poet and a writer in her own right, children's writer in her own right, is the daughter of Chaman Nahar. And uh, uh, I requested Anita Ji to talk uh, a little bit more about uh, her take on partition, of course, uh, the way, obviously, she could see it uh, in her father working uh, on the forces, working on her father, uh, the, the influences on her father, and also doing a take on uh, the relevance of Azadi, the novel, of course, uh, in 2021, sitting here in 2020. Keki Ji, of course, he has always returned to the partition days, uh, to the days of partition, to the metaphors that forged, that were forged in him during and after partition of India. Uh, his unique position, of course, as a lawman and as a writer, both allowed him uh, a slightly wider angle on uh, of her perspective on things than ordinary individuals like me, for example. Uh, he, he, could, he could actually see how it worked both ways, from the uh, side of the people, the people who were the victims, and of obviously the, the echelons of power, where things were being done, and how the law dealt with the entire situation, how the country and its administrative mechanism dealt with these situations, uh, even the, 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 the explosion of uh, these uh, similar communal situations after independence in India. He has uh, had a, a very clear, succinct, and a very distinct view of things. And I'm of, uh, absolutely sure that uh, he's not only going to speak about them in general, but also the impact of those things on his writings, especially that novel, uh, Ancestral Affairs, where he takes us into Junagar, you know, you know, the years just about leading up to partition and what, ha what it does in a, in a local way to the local politics, and of course, you know, on a larger front. He's going to read and share and uh, regale us and tell us some of his uh, deep insights today. So uh, without further ado, I would now request uh, Keki Darwala to take center stage and to tell us about his idea of partition, its enduring importance to us today, and of course, his own work and how he brought about those uh, metaphors, those images, those memories back into his writing. Ekiji, it's all yours. Sir, just you are requested to switch on audio, sir. Please unmute. Ekiji, can you hear me? Hello, Ekiji, can you hear me? Am I audible now? Yes, Kekiji, we can hear you perfectly. Yes, uh, I had unmuted myself and still, anyway. Uh, the partition is a world by itself. The deracination, the exile, the blood, the conflicts, the riots. And I'm not going to talk about partition literature as such. I'm only going to talk about my, my own journey through partition writing. And that's it. Uh, otherwise, you start talking about Kushwan Singh, you, Dr. Chabad Nehal, uh, Azadi, which won the Sahitya Academy Award. Uh, I'm not going to talk about literature as such. I'm going to talk about what I experienced and my family experienced in the partition and how we went about it. And my first observation is that the colonial structures were coming down. They had been unhinged and people wanted change after the second war and their Aspirate freedom arose and a freedom uh, in all its 
uh, strands. And the strands for such aspirations were racial, were communal, uh, what we call sectarian, and anti-color uh, discrimination. I was, uh, uh, I was in Zimbabwe for the 1980 elections, which got uh, uh, Mugabe in, in the chair. And I stayed two months, almost two months, uh, supervising as an assistant uh, assistant, uh, what do you call it, observer, observer for the elections from the, uh, on behalf of the Commonwealth. So I, I, I know something about it. So in South Africa and in Zimbabwe, there were agitations and a movement for freedom from apartheid. And in um, Israel and Palestine, uh, there were other aspirations. And here we went about in a very sectarian manner. I, I both, I, I think both people living in India and in Pakistan uh, would be really ashamed of what happened uh, during the partition. I'm taking a few liberties and the first is that while we are saying all the time that we were guilty and uh, I think progressive literature is abound, abounds with uh, partition stories, none of which I really liked, I'm, uh, I'm unhappy with. Uh, the what the progressive writers did with uh, with the partition, but I want to first blame the British for leaving us so speedily. I have a full novel almost on uh, the partition, which is called the Ancestral Affairs. And uh, the first we heard about cutting up Punjab in two and Bengal in two and uh, all the rest was on June third, and by and uh, I have a I'll I'll read a very 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 small passage, a very small passage where. It said, the most, June 3rd, the most momentous day in the history of India, the country is cut up in half. The British plan for the transfer of power is announced. Immediate dominion status granted. It is clear that the, etc., etc. And within one month, I, I spent six months in the Nehru Memorial library going through every single newspaper of 1947. That's how I worked for six months and then I started my my novel. And uh, the, on July 4th, within a month and one day, they changed it. The, uh, earlier, this was that we were going, the British were leaving in 1948, and on July 4th comes another bombshell. The Twin Dominion status will come into existence on August 15th, 1947, as also boundary commissions for Bengal and Punjab with Cyril Ratcliffe heading them. A referendum is to be held in Sylhet on 6 and 7 when uh, they decided by 2,20,000 votes against 1,80,000 uh, votes uh, for going into um, uh, East Pakistan and later on Bangladesh. A few days later, we get to know that Jinnah will be Governor General of Pakistan. Still, it decides to join Pakistan with 2 lakhs and so on. Uh, the, the, and 
uh, one lakh eighty thousand wanting to remain in India. So I think they could have easily supervised the terrible tensions those days. They had the troops in under them. Uh, they could have had the troops going on over to Pakistan to look after the refugees from India into Pakistan and look after the Dogra regiments and all the other regiments uh, to look after the refugees coming from uh, West Pakistan into, into India. But I think the British completely disappointed us and them. And I think a major focus on how the British abdicated and how they almost uh, ran home uh, uh, is something we should also focus on when we talk about partition. We talk about the bloodlust of the Sikhs and the Hindus and the Mohammedans on the other side or the Muslims on the other side. But we should not forget the way the British let, let us down. We were moving from Lalpur. It was not Shah Faisalabad in those days to Junagat, leaving my elder brothers, two of them, in Lalpur and Lahore. I have a, I'll read a small passage from a childhood poem. Uh, A.K. Ramanujan always asked me to write uh, something on the on my childhood, and after two or three reminders from him, I relented and wrote this poem. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's a long one, but I'll read a few small passages. Childhood poem for A.K. Ramanujan. There's precious little to a childhood once. You've forgotten it. One can probe no further. In limbo, one absence, one vacancy is as good as another. Why can't we remember, my wife asks. I can. I do not answer, wish to avoid friction. I couldn't be unique in my forgetfulness. Childhood is a fairly common affliction. My few memories are of Lalpur, now Faisalabad, named after the king. If Idi Amin signed a large enough check, they would have named this dust bowl after him. That was, I was rather uh, short. And then I'm to, I'll talk about the, the, the main part of the poem. Two years before, sorry, I'll read uh, another para if I may. I was taken piggyback to watch Muharram streaming down the radials to the Goal Bazaar. A clutch of chained knives played a jingle on their backs. The dead saints saw to it, they left no scars. Two years before Muslims asked for another country, the way you reach out for another piece of bread. We left Lalpur for Junagadh, left two brothers behind. Now one of them is dead. Now both are dead. Both were about seven and ten years older than me. And I wouldn't have written these lines today if I was writing those. I, I wrote them about 40 years back. They went through hell, that is Punjab, Sindh, Rajputana, showing sacred threads each time to prove a different case. Not Hindu first, not Muslim later. One took shelter in a brothel. Lucky guy, I wish I were at his place. But what they told me then is vivid still. The summer of 1947, 
the saber procession, two miles long, blue robed nihangs, and an overhang of dust like a scourge from heaven. The procession sneaking like a turban unwound, fiery slogans, sabers drawn, Akhan Brahega Hindustan, Nahi Banega Pakistan. But I wasn't there. The procession for me was a string of long robed, spear headed words. What can one say when simulacra turns vivid and the real gets blurred? Beyond this, I recall nothing. That's the last stanza of the poem. Beyond this, I recall nothing. The gates of memory have been closed. Sometimes I mourn for this loss of faces that haunted past now sadly devoid of ghosts. So politics took over the trouble about partition writing and partition literature is and partition writing, all writing, whether it's, uh, I don't want to men mention names, so I'd rather uh, not do it. Uh, but it is all about Punjab. It's centered in Punjab. So is this novel, because my elder brother was in Goragali, uh, Mari once, much before the partition. Uh, but I put the central character there and I remember my brother telling me that they were so sons of soldiers and uh, he had 51 fisticuffs 51 fights in one year the first year he was there and all that comes into my novel with uh, other characters etc now you are, so the, you have to have some central metaphor if you are writing a novel. And my novel, my, the, my central metaphors were that you are serving one master and your heart is elsewhere. I put a, a a lawyer, a very famous lawyer, who's having some trouble with his wife as the law member, because I was in Junagar and the son of the Divan and the son of the law member of the Executive Council uh, were my class fellows. One was named Ahmed and uh, the Divan, uh, Abdul Qadir's son was uh, Shafiq. So they the central metaphor was this, and as the novel raced on, the he has trouble with his wife, and he tells her that he has had an affair, and the marriage breaks down, but there is no official divorce, and they uh, separate from each other. So the two the two metaphors. Uh, and he was all the time saying that you must join India. You must tell. He told the uh, Divan, and he told, uh, uh, and he tells the Nawab in his two meetings with the Nawab, uh, Mahabat Ali Khanji. He had four wives: the Bhopal Begum, the Junagad Begum, the Kutiana Begum, and the Kutiana Begum's uh, sister, uh, the Rani Masab. Then he wanted to marry uh, the Begum, who was known as the Zahur Begum. And uh, eventually he had to divorce the Judangad Begum, the second Begum. And uh, over a very, very stupid uh, excuse that uh, she had put pin pins in the kebabs being served to the Nabab and wanted to well, assassinate or whatever it is, and she was divorced. Anyway, I, I know the 
family and I know the whole story and I don't want to retell it here. So what I wanted to say was something, some metaphor, some central metaphor has to bolster up a novel or uh, even a short story. Uh, even a short story should have a metaphor. Otherwise, it's uh, killing, killing, killing. I have talked to people, um, men. Uh, I was in uh, uh, government, uh, in the cabinet secretariat. Anyone leaving for a job to in the embassy in Pakistan or the high commission in Pakistan, uh, they had to uh, be interviewed by me. And one of them said that his story was rather pathetic. They were caught in West Punjab. They were all in the, in a, they sought shelter in a mosque. And the Malbi and the, the males converted to Islam. And the, the, the hooligans were out to kill all of them, their families. There were 14 or 15 of them with their wives and sisters, etc. And uh, the Malbi said, nothing doing. The, the men have converted and I'll not let you uh, touch a single person. The women said, we will not abide. We will not go to another religion. And they lay on the uh, floor of the mosque. And one woman took a sword and cut their throats, all the 14 of them. The irony, I, I have not talked about this ever so far. But the irony comes in that at dawn, the Dogra's troops reached the town, I think it was Shekhupura, and the men were brought safely to India, and all the ladies were dead. I mean, and such stories you will find from the other side also, uh, which were, uh, which are heartrending. And I, I must say about, uh, we had a meeting at the Sahitya Academy when two very well-known writers were talking. And they were only impressing upon how they depicted the Hindus and the Sikhs worse than the Muslims uh, in their writing in Pakistan ever showed them to be. I mean, that was the criteria. If the if you are writing about the partition, you should show your own side worse than the other. And I don't think, I think they went astray. Uh, they never looked for, they never searched for a decent metaphor to write about it. Uh, a great event, say, right the like the Russian Revolution. The Russian Revolution got uh, nothing less than past a neck. And you read Doctor Zivago, and you feel, uh, and the uh, the what shall I say? That that scene where the wolves are howling, and. Uh, uh, the, the Dr. Zivako is writing his poems and Lara is with him. Uh, uh, it's one of the greatest moments uh, you will ever find in literature. It is one of the great moments uh, uh, in uh, all of literature, uh, whether in one language or the other. Uh. I wanted to say that imagined reality is also a reality. Your word is, I'll, I'll read a small thing, the 
world as it is imagined is every bit as important as the world as it exists. In this way, literature creates a new reality. Whatever is written in 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 literature, when the when the creative imagination starts really working, uh, that is also as corporeal, as material, as the reality we experience all along. I mean, I'm uh, drinking a glass of water. That is also reality. I've also written short stories on the partition. One of them is completely lost. The other one is in in a high wind, in a high wind. Uh, that uh, Ravi Dayal published it in the Minister for uh, Permanent Unrest. And it's all about Lucknow. People are talking, a family is talking whether they should hang on to Lucknow or go to Pakistan. And they, they can't imagine going to Pakistan. And there's only the Khala, the Khala, I think that's the aunt. All, the whole family doesn't want to move. And slowly a small incident takes place. Another small incident takes place. And they have a relation in Pano Akil in Sindh, and they first uh, deride Pano Akil. And then, eventually, in the last three lines, they decide that is, it is best to move to Pakistan. So, what I was saying is the deracination exile these are the kind of motives which people should have grabbed they didn't even amrita pritam had this very fine very fine story uh, and that poem ka marishanu ke tu kabra micho bol te fir how, how can i but uh, she had a story uh, where uh, the Muslim lady is uh, abducted, kidnapped, whatever it is. And uh, then she has children. And then when the, uh, there was a joint effort by both India and Pakistan, to get the women back, uh, the woman refuses to go. I, I don't remember the name of the story. Uh, I'm sure it's uh, in Punjabi literature, it must be a, a standard, uh, sort of a milestone. But for me, there was no metaphor in, in it. I mean, uh, writing should be layered should have should have something more than an imagined depiction of what has actually happened to the ground. I don't want a photograph of what happened to to people, uh, to events, to people. I have uh, another story there, and this was a. Uh, but there was no slaughter, there was no blood. I made a point of it. There should not be any blood, there should not be any slaughter. Otherwise, you can read uh, as many tomes of non, non fiction, of reportage. You can go to a library now, and every a newspaper uh, will of 1947 and 48 and 46. 46 was equally bad. Oh, 46 was equally bad. Uh, uh, and get by. So, 
so my emphasis was on on writing and doing something i mean uh, it occurred to me only today that look what pasternak did with the russian revolution otherwise the russian revolution was very 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 cruel i have uh, read books on stalin and uh, i have uh, a lot on akhmatova and mandelstam being uh, poetry being my first profession if i may say so uh, in my literary life and i i i think one should uh, have a seminar on what a writer should when he gets into the partition the maelstrom of the terrible partition and the uh, historical backdrop and the backdrop goes right up to somnath and mohammad gori and then the khiljis and the tughlaqs and all of them come in and today the uh, the uh, propaganda uh, is all the time uh, quietly it's not very visible but it is quietly almost uh, an undertow underground an undertow which says that now we must uh, undo undo history uh, there was a minister who said that haldigati we must say that uh, rana pratap won at haldigati and i i mean all this nonsense is, is is going on and we are living through that kind of a reality today we so i i don't think i have much more to say on these particular uh things uh, i mean my uh, uh and one flukes into metaphor one flukes into parallelisms in writing and when you look back at your literature i have one on the emergency and the emergency is an allegory i wrote that 3 years ago or 2 years ago uh oh where is the book uh yes uh swerving in solitude and i am talking about the emergency and what happened and and actually it is an allegory of what is almost happening today and no no critic has focused on that no critic has spotted it i i i am marvel i i am sorry and most reviewers uh, half the reviewers uh, come from the academia and i am a little surprised that no one i mean the people i have allegorized uh, are living <laughs> and uh, they are not talked about so i mean you can uh, i am thinking of a story now of a, a allegory where the man has written an allegory and reads every newspaper to find uh, to think that today i'll be exposed tomorrow i'll be exposed and he is never exposed he is never 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 exposed because no one penetrated that whole ambiance and spotlit the man whom the allegorist was spotlight i don't think i wish to go on further and would leave to uh, leave the stage to the the other speakers who are very much there and i am prepared to ask the few questions uh i i i i would like to field any questions if i get them thank you very much mr uh, professor devashish lahri and uh, professor nageshwar rao and professor anita nahal for listening to me so patiently
and I rambled. Uh, I mean, it's written uh, a piece. Uh, I rambled. Uh, I'm sorry for that. Thank you. Uh, we are so lucky to have you uh, ramble uh, for us, Kikiji. Uh, rummage through and ramble through your memories and your uh, very powerful feelings about uh, not just the partition, uh, not just in personal terms, as you outlined uh, instances, but also about partition writing. Uh, absolutely invaluable pieces of uh, insight for us. Uh, and uh, listening to you, of course, uh, I have that poem uh, that you wrote on uh, I'll just read the first couple of lines in the last uh, four lines of the poem because you raised that issue uh, about uh, Dr. Zhivago. The wolves are not baying at the moon. Their snouts are pointed towards the house of love. I quickly jump to the conclusion. They're not baying at the black blood drying on the dry leaf loam of the tiger. They're not baying in, at the winter of the revolution will snuff out the flame in that candlelit house of love. We, we exactly understand what KKG has been driving at uh, in, his, uh, uh, in the time that he has been talking to us this evening. Uh, uh, the facts that keep coming back, of course, uh, the, the visceral nature of imagined reality. And he, he talks about writing, planning to write, having written stories where the blood, the carnage is there, of course, I mean, it's not uh, a way, but it's not actually depicted. You can also give us a sense of the horror of the deep tragedy of the times, the darkness of the times, by actually not showing the killing or the, the graphic description of violence in the streets. And he said that, well, newspapers can do that. What does literature do? He has, he has, he has posed a question, a very serious question today. He has said that literature's task is to employ other means to, to, to access us, to somehow seize us differently, not just our uh, absolute cold uh, fear you know, running down our spines that uh, someone might uh, behead me in, on the street or someone might throw something at me and that might be fatal for me or et cetera, et cetera. It's not just that. It's the impact, the larger impact and how literature can actually bring this about that he has been trying to painstakingly show us, demonstrate for us and motivate us. Of course, we, we look at KKG as our great mentor, as our uh, great uh, uh, parent in terms of literature and his, his insights today as to how literature can deal with partition and what might be and how it might still be relevant to talk about partition today. Because not just again as a documentary thing, you know, uh, early criticism of partition in India has always tried to emphasize the documentary nature of that literature. No. But other ways in which, as I said at the very beginning of this evening, the partition remains, the tensions remain, the memories, the, the, the scars remain, they, they remain. So you do not have to actually poke a finger in my eye almost by throwing violence at me, absolutely violence, which I, which I know was there, was on the streets around. I don't, didn't need to be told again, but there are other ways in which other feelings, other, you know, uh, gestures could be brought to the fore. So we thank KKG for this wonderful and invigorating uh, session uh, and uh, the set of ideas and the readings that he has done for us. We'll of course get back to KKG after uh, Anita Ji's uh, lecture, Anita Ji's talk today. I move now to uh, Dr. Anita Nahal, uh, who will, uh, and I've, I've seen the, the PowerPoint that she has uh, uh, put together for us this evening. It promises to be a very inter inter interesting and intellectually stimulating take, just like Ekichi's on the, the partition of India. And of course, uh, the view of a, of a particular work of art, Azadi, which will focus our discussions. Anita ji, uh, if you could please take over and uh, you, know, you can speak for 35 to 40 minutes. Uh, we look forward to what you're going to share with us this evening. Anita ji, please. Thank you so much, Professor Larry, Professor Nageshwara Rao, for this kind invitation to be on the panel. As I said, I'm honored to be on the same panel with Dr. Daruwala. 
and um, I've known him as, of course, a great poet and followed him for many years, but he knew my father about whom I'm going to speak about his book, Chama Nahal and uh, Dr. Daruwala were known to each other. So I remember meeting Dr. Daruwala in my childhood and um, my father uh, speaking so highly about him. So it's a privilege for me to be here. And I wanted to say that Dr. Daruwala, I really enjoyed your lecture because you brought out certain central themes, particularly the, the emphasis on metaphor, that yeah, writings need to have a metaphor. And Professor Nageshwara Rao and Professor Lahiri, both of you brought about very key elements as well in your remarks, talking about multi-layered, how we approach events in his history or any events in a multi-layered fashion. And as you said, Professor Lahiri, that um, the partition still remains, um, even though like I was not born and I did not go through it, but we have gone through it um, as a result of the memory. So memorization, the memory of um, the partition times passed on to us. So it literally became oral history. And I am by training a, an historian. So passed on to us by our family members who went through it. So I'm going to try to address some of these things, but focus largely on uh, my father's novel. And Professor Larry, if the uh, PowerPoint can be shared on the screen. Samuel, uh, please bring up the PowerPoint. <clears throat> Wonderful. I don't know if you can take it into slideshow mode. If not, uh, is it visible? Is it clear, Professor Larry? Yes, absolutely. I can see it perfectly on screen. OK, great. So uh, Azadi, which was uh, written in 1975, and the on the left-hand side, you will see, if you're looking at the screen, that is the uh, original version of the book, which I have with me. I try to go on Amazon and try to buy, uh, if I can, all the versions of my father's novel, which I don't have. And this is the original one, which is published in the United States um, by uh, Houghton Mifflin, uh, a based in Boston. And the other two images of the book are uh, paperback books that are part of courses uh, in uh, different universities uh, in India. And of course, that's my father sitting right in the middle. Um, I do not think that is the library we had in, in the house because the I can see the structure is different. But I think, I believe from my memory, that that's probably a library either at Princeton University or at Harvard. And that picture was taken then. Um, next slide, please. So just to give a little con uh, sh very short context of how I am, how I personally view a uh, partition, um, Dr. Deruwala, uh, Daruwala and Professor Lahiri and Professor Nageshwar, we, they all spoke about um, how partition literature, talked about the divisiveness of partition. So I wanted to just a little bit draw that symbolism with the end of communism in Europe in the 1990s and uh, I'll come back to this slide later on, but I'm just introducing it right now. So Francis Fukuyama wrote this book called End of History when communism uh, crashed in Eastern Europe and ultimately in the Soviet Union, saying that the name of the book basically implied that with the end of communism, the tussle or the conflict between uh, capitalism and communism will come to an end and therefore history will rest. Um, Samuel P. Huntington came out soon, soon after with his book called Clash of Civilizations, in which he said that despite the end of communism, however, the world will keep churning in clashes, especially ethnic clashes all over the world. And then economists like Joel Kotkin wrote about how um, the power of economic dependency is so critical that the world is actually each, no country is an island itself. And countries will continue to maybe not go towards a third world war, um, though some are, will argue that a third world war is uh, right now going on in different ways. 
and of course covid has become our latest uh, the war that we are tackling so i wanted to throw these authors out just to say that in terms of uh, the partition uh, i believe that the identity crisis which both pakistan uh, which pakistan and many uh, pakistanis that i speak with and those especially living in the united states whom i know they speak more about the identity crisis which pakistan has and i believe that both countries have an ident an identity crisis that while 1947 becomes a date the beginning point of the two countries but that identity crisis of course emerged much earlier and the role of the or the role of the all india congress or the role of the british each had their own role to contribute so the identity crisis is you know in my understanding it's political then within the, these two countries you have the rural urban the secular communal the caste anti caste the progressive traditional men women lgbtq and subaltern so i perceive a well perceive partition from the lens of all these different identities and of course since independence um, we have had a lot of people to people connections and this people to people word actually reminds me of president eisenhower who developed a very strong ptp program with people to people in the 1950s um trying to project or trying to establish united states relationship with the different countries through people to people connections so pakistan and india have had those either through their the train journeys or the bus journeys people going across cricket so all these become uh, the people to people connections however if we are looking at the economic um journey these two countries have uh, the bitterness and suspicion between these two uh, countries have contributed to the uh, huge uh, enormous financial resources in both countries towards defense and national security and so forth and both countries are kind of ridden in um, high trade barriers underdeveloped transport infrastructure and regu regulatory hurdles so these are some of the backgrounds that i just wanted to all of you to keep in mind and that also that the two countries have um, their relationship has been determined to a large extent uh, of the communist and the capitalist blocks and the non aligned movement as well which now we are going probably going to see a change i recently attended a lecture by uh, the president of the brookings institute which is the largest non profit think tank in in the united states and he uh, his name is john Al allen he was a general he's a retired general now he's president of the brookings institute and he said that going forward he was identifying what are the key areas in the world and he spoke about the shift that the united states will more largely follow and uh, the need for a, a deeper closer relationship with india so my views on partition are really like a jigsaw puzzle i tend i tend to be a consensus historian my uh, the theor theoretical understanding emerges from subaltern historians like ranjit gua and uh, gyan pande uh, shahid amin gayatri chakravarti and also with historians from like bipin chandra and um, shekhar bandopadhyay just to name a few so that's the background um next slide please all right so as far as azadi is concerned and i wanted to show you the inner page i don't know if it's i made i should have made a slide on it but the inner page of the book and the back cover is actually a map and it shows you the uh you know the radcliffe line and the other um key areas in the west and in east where the partition uh impacted and took place and there's also an Im image here of the caravans of people that moved at that time and professor lairi professor nigeshwar rao in your flyer you also had shown the image of people piled up on trains so azadi uh, which was published in 1975 and 
um, became actually the last novel in a quartet, which I'll speak to you uh, about later, though it, he wrote it first. And the main themes in his novel, in this novel, were humanism. He did not blame any side. He did not blame the Muslims or the Hindus. So very humanistic approach. He was against uh, the abuse that many women went through on both sides. So the novel is very progressive in its writing. It's far ahead of its time. It's secular in its approach. It's anti-communal. It's anti-caste based on the different characters and the uh, relationships that are interwoven in the story. The story about um, uh, this Punjabi family that leaves Sialkot in the middle of the night and moves to uh, India. By the way, my father was born in, in Sialkot and this novel could be in many ways um, um, based on personal accounts is so in, could, could be confessional in many ways and many ways it is uh, fictional. One of the um, uh, very real uh, event that is portrayed in the book and, and he dedicates the book to his sister Kartara Devi who was killed. He, she was pregnant uh, and she was coming with her husband in the train. She was also trying to escape over to India and they were killed in the train and their bodies were later found in a refugee camp. And um, so my father talks about that in the novel. Uh, I'm not 100% sure how much of what he portrays in the novel is fictionalized in, the, in terms of the minute details. But that was the uh, trauma that his family witnessed. But in his novel, he brings that out. But and I'll talk about it a bit later. He talks that how it happened to so many other women who could have been his sisters, Muslim women going to Pakistan. So anti-communal, anti-caste, subaltern. The uh, characters in his novel are common people like us. So they could be shopkeepers or small farmers, um, the street vendor. There's a woman whose son is in jail and she refuses to leave. Pakistan leaves Sialkot when they were trying to move uh, originally to a refugee camp within Pakistan and then move, go, go on to India. So subaltern characters, the novel is very positivist towards the end, even though it, it does de depict the atrocities that happened on both ends. But the storyline ultimately ends in positivism when the family finally reaches um, Delhi and finds some semblance of I won't say normalcy, but find some semblance of, you know, rooting themselves, rooting themselves in this new world that was now going to be their home. So in that sense, the novel is also very realist. Uh, next slide, please. So looking at womanism and the anti-women abuse and progressivism, Professor Shobha Tiwari writes about Azadi. Vividly painting all the realities, Chama Nahal poignantly touches the subject of women victims. Women were the worst victims. They were the hardest hit. In each hurt Muslim girl, he saw his own daughter Madhu, whom he had lost in Pakistan in the violence erupted by the partition. And she's referring to Lala Kanshi Ram, who is the main character uh, in the novel. Um, I want you to say that my mother also moved from Pakistan at the same time. They were not married to each other at that time. They met later in Delhi. But my mother is originally from Lahore. And um, she also used to share stories uh, about the challenges and the difficulty and how they reached Delhi. Um, but in terms of a traumatic family loss, that happened in my father's family and not in her family. So just to read a bit from the novel, page 338. Um, this is a, uh, this scene depicts Lala Kanshi Ram talking to his wife, uh, Prabha Rani, and they're talking about the hate. Prabha Rani is depicted here as filled with hate for Muslims because her daughter Madhu was killed in the train. And he says that nothing uh, can bring back anything my Madhu particularly. He sounded so desolate 
and it was with difficulty he completed the sentence. Prabha Rani goes on. What I mean is, um, she, sorry, he goes on. Whatever, what I mean is, whatever the Muslims did to us in Pakistan, we are doing to them here. Prabha Rani watched him, trying to solve in her mind the complexities of his argument. She wanted to nod in agreement, but could not. Lala Kanshi Ram went on, every single horror, every single horror, and the thousands killed without reason, raped, our women raped, dro uh, driven out of our homes, happened on both sides, exactly the same. So in his novel, and his novel has uh, uh, um, crit critics and um, those who have written on his novel, there have been so many MPhil and PhD uh, theses on Azadi, have said that this is the most unexotic. The novel is not an exotic portrayal of the partition. It's very realist, very balanced, and very humanistic. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of secularism, anti-communal and anti-caste, just another quotation, Jamana shows his remarkable powers of observation of the human nature in general and the political behavior of Hindus and Muslims in particular. Though the novel is tragic in its tone, it is epical in its vast canvas. The greatness of Jamanaha lies in his fear, an impartial picture of the Hindu-Muslim hatred with love and their emotion, emotion and political relationships and the oblivious relationship between India and British people in a very practical and highly structured manner. The novel is a landmark in the Indian English political fiction, providing solid material both to the literary critic and the political psychologist for atheistic enjoyment and dispatch dispassionate research. And what Dr. Deruela talked about also about blaming the British, that now that comes throughout through uh, comes out very thoroughly in um, my father's novel as well, blaming the uh, British. Um, for example, on page um, ninety six, he says that um, he talks about the conspiracy of politicians. So la again, by he I mean Lala Kanshiram. All these uh, points and these um, thought processes are emerging from the central character of the novel, Lala Kanshiram. And he says, he talks about the conspiracy of politicians behind the whole move. Nehru, Jinnah, Liaquat Ali Khan. Why else would they rush into Azadi at this space? An Azadi which would ruin the land and destroy its unity. One would have to go around with tweezers through all the villages to separate the Muslims from the Hindus. Then he talks further on, he says, he calls it a game. He came a game, unfortunately, that politicians initiated and the impact was felt on millions of people that moved across the border. Next slide, please. So just to further uh, give just one more quotation, He's, uh, this is by Bhartendra Shiran, he says, Taman Azadi is a modern classic which conceals an inclusive revolution of life, signifying the chaos that partition played on the people of the country, both at the social and individual levels. It portrays the realistic historical documentation of the atrocious confrontations caused by the partition through literary perspective. As Chamanahal himself was a refugee, he writes with incredible ingress and realism about the awful incidents caused by the partition and the wretched circumstances of the de deracinated refugees after the partition. So my father's family moved to, came to New Delhi and so did my mother's family. And I was talking earlier about how the novel ends in hope and in positivism. So Lala Kanshiram in the last page is the, the length of the novel is from the, uh, declare, uh, the announcement of the partition to come. So June, 1947, till, uh, till the, a couple of days after Mahatma Gandhi's death in January 1948. And Lala Kanshi Ram's family, when they reached uh, New Delhi, they went around looking for a refugee uh, allotment of some kind of a home to them. And in the last pages, Lala Kanshi Ram is talking to a, an officer who is trying to give them 
a house and the officer says, you are late. All the uh, 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 homes have almost been given away because Lala Kanshi Ram was arguing, we left our uh, you know, home, our artifacts, our clothing, books, everything that we owned back in Pakistan, like people moving to Pakistan did here. So our, can't we get one of those homes just as someone would get ours when they get there? So the reciprocity and the uh, refugee officer said that you are late. But he gives Lala Kanshi Ram's family uh, a, a placement in a, a refugee camp in, in, in the Kingsway camp in North Delhi. And Lala Kanshi Ram was very disappointed. But when he reaches the camp, he sees that the uh, it's not like uh, the hut mills that been, they had been living in. It actually had a proper corrugated tin roof. So it kind of up, uplifts him. And the end of the novel, um, one of the characters, Madhu, she's, uh, she's a seamstress and she's sewing in, in one of the rooms. The, 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 the uh, structure had two rooms. In the other room, she's sewing something. And um, to Lala Kashiram, the hum of her machine tries, actually exemplifies life, that the life will go on and they will be okay. So that's how it ends in positivism. Next slide, please. So I just want to uh, go back to what I mentioned here. Though Azadi was written the first in 1975, then after that, my father went back and uh, started to write a full series of novels on Mahatma Gandhi. He was very deeply influenced by Mahatma Gandhi in many ways. And he wrote these four novels, which later were put together, called The Gandhi Quartet. And the first was The Crown and the Loincloth in 1981, followed The Salt of Life in 1990, and The Triumph of the Tricolor in 1993. And Azadi, time-wise, becomes the last, though it was written the first, and it received the Sahitya Academy Award in 1977. By the way, I did this cover for his book. I did a few covers for my father's book. He somehow had faith in my artistic ability. And when I did this cover, I told him, it's not a good cover. Because look, even the lines are not clean and uh, the lines are not perfect. And he said that humans are not perfect and Gandhiji wasn't perfect. So I like your cover. Let's leave your cover as it is. And these four books basically cover the different movements of Mahatma Gandhi, non-cooperation, the civil disobedience and the Quit India movement. Uh, next slide, please. And um, so coming back to what I started with Francis Fukuyama, Samuel P. Huntington, and Joel Kotkin, I wanted to say that all those themes revolve, you know, come forth in Jamanaha's Azadi as well. Um, uh, the fact that divisive forces took the two communities, Hindus and Muslims, set them apart. The identity crisis is there, it's still lingering. Uh, perhaps, as Professor Larry, you mentioned that someone said to you that now we need to give it up, give that time. So I don't think the roots where we come from can be given up. Maybe we can alter those roots to focus on things that can take these two countries forward to a better future individually and with each other. Azadi's uh, emphasis, the uh, themes that he has used of humanism, you know, women abuse, just to give you a few other examples, Sadat Hassan Mantos, Koldo, and his uh, short story, Toba Takes In, really strike in my mind. Amra Pre Amita Pritham's poem as well, Today I Ask You, What is Shah? Or Bipasi Sidwa's Ice Candy Man, which later became a mo the movie Earth by Deepa Mehta. So the emphasis on women, the emphasis on subaltern characters, are things that which were there in uh, Jamanha's novel are also in some of these few examples that I am referring to. Next slide, please. So this is a little uh, small. I can see now that the slide is small, but I'm just going to sum it up. I wanted to talk about the literary sources that my father has employed in uh, Azadi. But before I get to there, just to reiterate, you know, far ahead of his time, progressiveness, no bitterness, no blame, et cetera, positive realist, kind of reminds me of President Obama's book, uh, The Audacity of Hope, because the novel ends in hope. 
So the literary sources employed in Azadi include allegory, of course, colloquialism, flashback, foreshadowing, foreshadowing hyperbole, so exaggerating on certain statements in order to draw out emphasis, imagery, the novel is deeply seated and steeped in imagery, irony, sarcasm, satire, mood and tone are, is, and are in other literary sources employed by him. Personification, the book is par partially confessional. Using repetition in words, therefore emphasizing again and again what happened on both sides. Soliloquy, solilu and that is the emphasis on drama when a character speaks out with strong emphasis and of course, symbolism. So these are the ones that I have noticed. There could be others, other literary sources as well that are... Um, that Jaman Nahar, my father, used in his uh, novel. Next slide, please, please. I'm going to end with two poems. I'm going to read a translation of Amrita Pritam's poem. Today I ask you, Varis Shah, and then end with my, my poem from my latest book, which is on Gandhi. So Amrita Pritam says, and you know, in translation, transcribing some of the essence goes so those who know the poem in Punjabi, I, I thought first I would read, I would say it out in Punjabi. I can't read Punjabi, but we of course speak Punjabi, but then I opted to read it out in English. I say to Waris Shah today, speak from your grave and add a new page to your book of love. Once one daughter of Punjab wept and you wrote a long saga, you wrote your long saga. Today thousands weep Calling to you, Varis Shah, arise, O friend of the afflicted, arise and see the state of Punjab. Corpuses strewn on fields and the Chenab flowing with much blood. Someone filled the five rivers with poison and this same water now irrigates our soil. Where was lost the flute? Where the songs of love sounded? And all Ranja's brothers forgotten to play the flute? Blood has rained on the soil. Graves are oozing with blood. The princess of love cry. Princesses of love cry their hearts out in the graveyards. Today all the Kwaidanos, the uncles, the different relatives, all the Kwaidanos have become the thieves of love and beauty. Where can we find another one like Varis Shah? Varisha, I say to you, speak from your grave and add a new page to your book of love. Last slide, please. And this is a poem from my, my third book of poetry, which came out earlier this year called What's Wrong With Us Kali Women and published by Kelsey Books. So a shout out to Kelsey Books. Uh, they are based in Utah in the United States. So... This book is, uh, this novel, uh, this, sorry, this poem is called Gandhi's Chadar. So I thought I would conclude with that. Gandhi's Chadar was soiled from agony, loss, and it was weighted, demoralized, dripping with the howls of humans, kicked, beaten, violated, deserted, forsaken. Millions of Chadars soiled from India to Pakistan, Pakistan to India, one nation, two hearts, beginning to beat their own drums at a very soiled hour. My chadar is not soiled, not soiled, not soiled, like those of my parents, like those of millions unknown, like that of Gandhi's. My chadar is not soiled, not soiled with blood, bones, limbs, and the tears from movement, migration, displacement, from scuttling, begging to be left alive. I'm grateful, grateful for sacrifices that make me stand tall and free today. My heart bows, my mind reflects, my soul is humbled at the relentless march from India to Pakistan, Pakistan to India, one nation, two hearts, beginning to beat their beat, their or beginning, beginning to beat their own drums at a very soiled hour. Numerous old philosoph philosophies Gandhi carried in a knot at one end of his chadar, unwound to woo the masses at timed moments. 
Satyagraha and Ahimsa, not new, were repositioned in the political world to impel, attract Indians, to confound, exasperate the British. With a chadar and a small loincloth, an ingenuous man circumstances created, a compelling man events dictated. My chadar shudders from harrowing pressures of his conclusions, choices, and of people without choice from India to Pakistan, Pakistan to India, one nation, two hearts, beginning to beat their own drums at a very soiled hour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anika Ji. Uh, uh, very moving end to your talk. Uh, the two poems that you read out, uh, of course, Amrita Pritam's poem in translation, in your own, uh, Gandhi's Chadar, which uh, uh, I was lucky to read, of course, because you sent me that poem a few uh, weeks, uh, probably a month back. You sent me that poem, and I read it. Uh, so again, uh, it, 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 it again, I mean, homes us back to what Kikiji was talking about, finding that metaphor. Uh, a graphic description of violence, 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 this unending cycle of violence, this uh, interminable nightmare of violence. Uh, there must be other life-giving ways of talking about that moment, that moment of darkness, indecision, pain, madness, whatever. Uh, we have some few minutes uh, where we can engage in a little tete-a-tete -tete with each other. Uh, I, 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 I wanted to start uh, by asking uh, Kekiji, uh, even in today's uh, talk, Kekiji, you refer to the hard work necessary on the part of a writer. The, you talked about spending six months trying to read the newspapers to absorb all of those details in order to write your novel, Ancestral Affairs. Later on, write about uh, with more authority uh, about those times. But uh, the absorption of public events then gives you a, a, a inside your writer's sensibility, uh, a peek into what characters who lived through those times might have felt. Now, I, I, you, you emphasized elsewhere as well about the slog, and you have, you have to slog hard to be a good writer. Uh, and and uh, I, I wanted to ask you about how much, and you, and you talked about personal history today. You brought up uh, uh, certain uh, details about how your family actually faced the, the prospect of partition and when they came over from Lahore. Uh, so. Uh, before I ask you that question, uh, I would like to just read a couple of lines from uh, a translation that you made of Faiz's poem. Uh, where you write, you translate it as the sad city. Though everyone didn't own a bar or plenty's horn, this city was never so melancholy and forlorn. Uh, I mean, and in the past, you've talked about uh, the, the with, with great, uh, uh, you might say, zest. Uh, in a celebratory manner about the fact that you were lucky to learn Urdu while you were in Lahore, being a Parsi, and the, the, the kind of vistas it opened for you uh, going forward in your literary career. I mean, uh, sir, could you talk a little bit more about, not partition, but something absolutely related to it, your very cosmopolitan upbringing uh, in Lahore and how it helped your literary career later on. You have, I think uh, if I recollect very uh, correctly, you have used the, your, uh, and you have said that you have used the word guzishta uh, a lot, even in your English writing. Uh, that, that's uh, the past. I began by reciting a few lines from a partition guzzle where the take on the past is brilliant. So you, you talked about how you use that Urdu word guzishta in the context of the past. And it does not mean the same as English past. Slightly different. It has a different connotation. So, could you talk about your upbringing, your cosmopolitan training in languages, in culture, in Lahore, and how it helped you uh, not only uh, talk about partition, but in a, in a larger context, uh, how it helped you in your literary career? Ekiji. Thank you. Thank you for the question. But I, much of, I hope I am audible. 
Yes, sir. You you are perfectly audible. Much of much of what I wrote, or I'm still writing. Uh, I I keep away from the partition. Uh, is that firstly I grew up in Lalpur, and whatever I have recollected now is from what I gathered in Junagadh. when where my father was the tutor and guardian to the princes uh, is about what my brothers told me about the partition so the grounding in lalpur and lahore was of not much uh, use to me my childhood is uh governed by junagadh those four years from 1945 to 1948 the vallabhai patel coming to the bahaudin college and using a wrong metaphor when he said in gujarati that the hyderabad is is in our stomach we can Uh, swallow it whenever we want to. He, he was, he was very phlegmatic, uh, very cold, and uh, the man we needed him. And he had a tremendous secretary, uh, uh, nothing, no less than B. P. Menon. Uh, I have his whole book with me. I bought it for, I remember, for seven rupees, and it's. Six hundred, almost six hundred pages. Four, five hundred pages. Four eighty-four, and he has talked about every native state. Native state. The, that that is what uh, the Indian princes were called. And I want to say this about. Uh, I didn't talk about this. That uh, before partition, uh, the princes were really thinking of three Indias. One Muslim India, one the Hindu India or Hindu and Sikh India, and the third would be the Princess India. They 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 were in that kind of uh, what shall I say uh, illusion, Ill, uh, collective illusion. Uh, illusion is one word. I mean, for me or for uh, let's say Devashish Lahiri, but if it's a collective illusion. Uh, then it becomes dangerous, and it was a collective illusion with those five hundred, or actually there were seven hundred. There were seven hundred princes. There were jagirdars also in involved. There were small princes, and they were all thinking that uh, the 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 the, uh, the jagirdars and the princes would have another. Would rule over another kind of India. All the lands were with them. So what Vallabhai Patel and his uh, tremendous secretary B. P. Benan uh, managed. Uh, I mean, the, uh, now the books are not available, but uh, people must must read this book. In in it would be fetched in libraries. How how he managed each. Each particular, I mean, uh, for example, in my novel, I have talked about the the B. P. Menon coming as the plenipotentiary of India, the government of India, with a letter for the Nawab and the uh, prime, the Diwan of Junagadh, uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto's father, Shah Nawaz Bhutto. Uh, refuses to let him go meet the Nawab, saying that the Nawab is too ill. And then he said, "I would like to meet his Waliyad, Waliyad, the 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 eldest principal, uh, the and 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 the eldest prince, who later on became the governor of Sindh, Bhutto Zulfikar Ali Bhutto appointed him as the governor of Sindh, uh, and uh, he." Uh, the Shana was Bhutto said he is too busy. He is playing a cricket match, <laughs> and he was too busy to meet uh, the government of India emissaries, uh, Mr. 
Bipin uh, Menon and his uh, the commissioner the commissioner of Rajkot was um, Butch Butch. Uh, I have got all his papers. I have to give them to the archaeological uh, uh, survey, whatever it is called, uh, of government of India. I have all the papers with the with the pamphlets, the scurrilous pamphlets against the Babi family. Incidentally, it's the same family from which Parveen Babi came. Uh, is the Babi family, and it was the Babi, uh, what shall I say, uh, hold on Junagad, uh, which came about. I hope I have answered your your question to an extent. Thank you, thank you, Kekichi. Uh, that was again. Uh, I mean, this is exactly what I wanted to do. You know, to make you go back to those days and uh, the way in which you come up with these uh, wonderful ideas. Uh, so it's it's both. It's a, a, a wonderful opportunity of hearing you talk about those days uh, from your own very personal perspective, how you actually saw it, and then how it all got into your novel, your your work of fiction. So it's 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 a it's a double pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'll come back to you with uh, another question or two. I now wanted to ask uh, Anita Ji. Uh, uh, you you use uh, Samuel Huntingdon. Of course, uh, Huntingdon's book was uh, kind of a riposte to his uh, former student uh, Francis Fukuyama. His book. So, uh, and you, uh, how do you see it in the light of uh, Azadi, and of course, in the light of the uh, of partition? Because uh, Huntingdon's thesis is is about the culture wars. He talks about culture wars, uh, that the, the next set of wars will not be fought on a field of battle or they will be culture wars and uh, primarily and well, they can turn violent, of course, but they will cal primarily be culture wars. Now, uh, and that is kind of prefaced on the idea that uh, cultures, as he identifies them in his book, they are uh, distinct identities, you know, they're different from each other. And so therefore, there's this tussle going on between them. Uh, in the case of India and Pakistan, uh, and what happened during from 46 to 48, uh, how do you see this uh, confrontational and oppositionary uh, kind of uh, mentality uh, this, uh, that is outlined in Huntington's thesis applying to India and Pakistan? Because uh, mostly, I mean, I mean, as, as all of us know, and you have also emphasized uh, both KKG and yourself, that uh, we, we are of a shared tradition. I mean, uh, you talked about that particular quote out of uh, your father's novel, where he said that you have to go through the villages of India with tweezers to distinguish between Muslims and Hindus. Wow. So intertwined were their lives, such a shared heritage did they have. That, uh, and, and how do you see that suddenly falling apart, sundering, becoming so distinct and uh, well-defined that now there are two nations, uh, the two nation theory, of course. And uh, how does Huntington really apply? Can we really apply Huntington? I wanted you to just, just elaborate and think aloud for us uh, on, on that issue. Anita Ji. Yeah, sure. That's a wonderful question. So as I see it, um, and as an historian, I tend to look back in history to find um, ways to understand why historical events took place. So that my training is in that direction and how applicable it is to apply trends that take place after those events to current times. So when I'm uh, mentioning or talking about Samuel P. Huntington, basically, as you said, his argument was that the world will not be have a major war between these two blocks and other countries joining these two blocks, but it would be mired in small, small, small ethnic clashes all over the world and actually we see that whether it is in um, the middle east whether israel palestine whether it is what is happening in eastern europe right now and what has happened in india and pakistan and i think india and pakistan despite our shared history uh, despite the fact that uh, well after hash vardhana of course india was invaded by either it was uh, muslims coming from um, Central Asia, or we have the Europeans coming in after um, the 16th and 17th century. So I think that despite that shared history, 
I think countries like India and Pakistan are steeped in within, first of all, within themselves. If I could draw, let's look at two circles. Within India, you have so many different cultures. You know, you will have a North Indian culture and East Indian or South Indian or West Indian. Within that also, there are a lot of subdivisions. Then the caste differences. In Pakistan as well, you have different pockets. Well, East and West Pakistan were originally together. And then you have Bangladesh and you have now what is known as Pakistan. Within Pakistan, you have different communities who also don't get along. So you have Punjabis or you have Northwest Frontier, you have the Sindhis. So in that context, how I see Samuel P. Huntington is very relevant because I think that moving forward, and that's what I saw in my father's novel as well, that we have to build a new memory. If we are both countries are going to be steeped in their own cultural issues and then within themselves don't give up their identity crisis that these were nations that were artificially created and not having not looking going back and looking at that shared identity, then I think that India and Pakistan will constantly remain in that, uh, you know, um, uh, conflict, just as Israel Palestine have. So if we don't put history to an end, so maybe Francis Fukuyama, if we don't put, put history to an end, but tend to continue to squabble in those cultural clashes intra within the country and inter country, I think that's where Samuel P. Huntington becomes relevant because the world is churning and in this sector in ethnic clashes will continue to do so unless we put those to rest. So that's how I see it. Thank you, Anita Ji. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, it, it actually opens uh, the, the, the doors to, to another conversation, which uh, I would quickly uh, try to, because it, it rouses certain interesting ideas in my mind, the way in which you saw the relevance of Huntington in an analysis of partition and the way in which uh, India and Pakistan uh, went about their uh, cycles of self-definition. Uh, you talked about the necessity to move out of those anxieties uh, of uh, being uh, states forged by uh, a, a kind of a, uh, unnatural process, uh, not natural process. Uh, I, I was wondering if uh, you, you talked about the fact that India already, I mean, the subcontinent, let's put it this way, even before partition, was uh, privy to all these different kinds of ethnic and subcultural tugs and tussles. Uh, you talked about different kinds of India, different uh, social, political, religious orders and their uh, own little tugs and cycles and, and vortexes, if I could put it that way. Now, uh, are, uh, can we uh, argue the fact that uh, to apply, truly apply Huntington's thesis to a situation like India and Pakistan, we have to somehow go beyond the, the other brick wall, the other brick wall of China that has been created by post-colonial studies, and that is the nation state. That you know, you have to address either India and Pakistan as a nation state, and you cannot see it as a, a, a coming together of thousands and thousands of uh, local radicalisms or expressions or ideas or manifestations of ideas or whatever. So you have to see it as a kind of a monolithic structure, a big brick wall staring in the face, which is the nation state. And one of that, I think, uh, is, is one of the problems of, of applying Huntington's thesis. But if Huntington's thesis were applied in a case where these cultures that you talk about, that were always there, these conflicts with the neighboring cultures or neighboring tendencies and trajectories, that were always there, these uh, energies and uh, these uh, potential flashpoints, which were always there. Uh, if we could uh, apply Huntington's thesis, it, it better allows us to understand the situation in and, and sometimes even see partition in context uh, somehow, not as this great uh, you know divide and the, the two nations, but as a, as a summation of a lot of other things that was going on before and after uh, 46 and 48, uh, and, and which we tend to ignore you know when we sweepingly make those historical gestures of, of portraying partition sometimes. So thank you so much for inaugurating that idea and clarifying that point. Uh, if I can return to KGG once again. Uh, drawing uh, on the corollaries that you have drawn from partition, I mean, not just the violent incidents. Um, 
how important do you think and again given the, the modern day tendency of the very same thing happening again uh, we have seen uh, fact as fiction for example in your own novel you have transmuted those facts added to it imaginatively and then created fiction out of it but what about fiction as fact which is a, a rather dangerous thing don't you think in which is again something that we are again party to as we live through these times uh, so how do you see this uh, sir in balance kg uh, fiction is f- as fact or fa- fact is fiction a lot of the facts that we come across today are uh, almost like fiction i mean uh the the uh, what should i say they they, they pass the bounds of logic they pound pass the bounds of uh of logic if i may uh, contain myself to this fact fiction is fact remains with us i mean uh, all that uh, shakespeare wrote may not have been facts i mean uh, uh, othello could have been just picked up from a small small uh, incident you know uh, and uh, uh, a man repulsing the fleet and uh, leading macbeth may, may have been from uh, the scottish annals so fiction is what impresses the mind of the young and the old so the the witches of macbeth are as real to us double double toil and trouble fire burn and cauldron bubble uh, is uh, as real to us as uh, uh, lesson history uh, lesson in history so i talked about the two realities that the imaginative reality is uh, should not be uh, spurned it it is as it is as real as uh, the reality we confront each day we drink water from a bottle uh, that is reality and uh, the the poison someone is being poisoned is as as real so uh, i mean you read about the trials of the trial of Joan of Arc and you feel that uh, you are almost in a surreal uh, atmosphere that is, all this is nonsense and she was just a young lady uh, um, followed by her voices and uh, she fought the british and the the, the french they they, uh, they 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 burnt her on the stake so uh, fiction in fact and uh, i i don't feel that they should be divorced from each other unless you are writing a modern uh, what shall i say a, a, a report a reporter is writing and giving it a twist to suit his purpose or the party's purpose or the uh, ideology that he serves so we have to be very very careful and the reporters today have not read read enough they haven't imbibed enough whether they are writing about sports or they are writing about uh, politics and uh, their 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 inclinations uh, their political 
proclivities are clearly evident. So we have to be very careful when we deal with these problems. But I think that fiction and what about magic realism? You Once you go into uh, Borges, Borges was the starter. You you'll you'll have a you'll have a maelstrom. You'll have a maelstrom. That is my answer to it. Thank you, thank you, Kiki Ji. Uh, I had a one quick question for Anita Ji. Um, I mean, there has always been this uh, attempt in early literary criticism. Uh, when they came across this uh, thing called partition literature, let's put it this way. Um, there was this idea that this was madness, temporary madness descended upon a population of people. That they were now suddenly from peace loving, peaceable people to suddenly monsters that had become overnight almost. So, this idea about a madness, about an incomprehension, about uh, it being. Uh, extraneous to them. Uh, what about the horror of uh, the entirety of, uh, of whatever happened with partition uh, and, and its rendering in literature that uh, this was not ir irrationality suddenly descended upon a population of people. This was perfectly rational. They were perfectly their senses and that uh, this is what uh, men do when they are provoked by certain forces. So there's nothing abnormal in this entire thing. That you, can, you can always dismiss partition or you can always explain partition away as being this certain abnormality, uh, temporary madness, you know, almost like a, a criminal getting off uh, the capital sentence because he, was, he has been somehow uh, pronounced as non compos mentis, uh, of an unsound mind. So, this idea of partition and the violence surrounding partition is a reflection of this unsound mind of the people. And the British, I think, also uh, had this strange idea that on the one hand, there were this local, you know, uh, energies and, and, and violent reactions which they couldn't understand. So that, that was down there. And then there was something else called uh, the, the, the kind of the, the moral force of the of the of the, of the nation state as, as they saw it so again the two models so um, uh, when that colleague of mine talked about the fact that we needed to you know get over this this hangover of partition uh, was he trying to in some ways imply that uh, you know in order to grasp in order to uh, embrace this model of civilized society and this great nation state, that the British were also propagating at the time that you know this, this these 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 dark and bloody and miry days of partition they needed to be somehow swept under the carpet and uh, shown as well you know it was an excrescence the the the, the damage the, the destruction the the death the deracination this was all uh, kind of an excrescence you know temporary kind of outburst of madness perhaps on both sides of the border uh, do you see this uh, actually this tendency, this, this threat in scholarship in academia as, as a viable one? I mean, that uh, we need to really guard against these days, especially? Anitaji. What, what exactly is the question? Well, Sorry, is uh, Anitaji uh, answering it? Uh, you're welcome. Uh, Kiki Ji, you can also join. join. Absolutely, you can also join and answer the question. Um. Uh, should I should I uh, speak first? Yes. Okay. Yes. Sure. As you wish. As you wish. So, actually, your question uh, I'll connect it to the question you asked, Doctor Darwala, about fact and fiction and fiction and fact. So, because you have thrown in a couple of things, and so very interesting. You've spoken about fact and fiction. You're speaking speaking about violence and the need. Is was that was that an aberration? Was it a temporary aberration? Whether factually or in literature, how do we depict it? And moving forward, uh, where do we stand in terms of, uh, you know, letting go of these events? So a couple of dots I'd like to connect. 
first of all, I would like to say that uh, as an historian, I, I always tend to say, and I agree with what uh, Dr. Daruwala said, especially towards the end, he said that unless you're writing, a journalist is currently writing, or let us say an historian is writing a book. So when historians write something, you base it on something. Otherwise, it will be an opinion. It will not be based on facts. And so fact to show timeline and to show what happened in the past. But as we know, and there is an historian, very short book he wrote. His name is E.H. Carr, C-A-R-R. -R, and the name of the book is What is History? So in the context of what we are discussing, there is no... Professor Nairi, there is no uh, complete objectivity in history and there is no one way of looking at it. Let me put it like that. So because, for example, if I were 100 years from now, I, someone was to write on the partition of uh, India and, and two nations, uh, two nation, Pakistan and India, that person will base it on the available facts left behind. So it, it will never be entirely objective. So objectivity in history or in recounting even in, uh, in fictional or in literature, is not absolutely possible. Now, having said that, to come to your other po point about is it an ab was it an aberration, a temporary aberration, as partition literature has described it, and that they should be forgiven, they shouldn't be given a life sentence or put in jail, you know, what happened at that time, the atrocities. And I would say that let's look at history. Look at slavery. Look at the way millions of Africans were enslaved and taken to different countries, put in ships like literally like sardines, and they were brought to the Western world. Mothers sold to one plantation, parent, father to another, children to another. So that kind of violence is unimaginable. Or, for example, the Holocaust. It is something that our mind cannot even fathom that people can do that. Or something that happens... Uh, it currently, in so many parts of the world, the way refugees are being treated in different parts of the world. So I think that violence, I am not the best person to talk about the well, violence in the partition was an aberration or not, because I, I didn't go through it. But I think that when you are put, when you're put in certain circumstances, uh, as you said, you might be compelled to do certain things. Now, whether it is right or wrong, the morality of the right and wrong is a question that we will continue to respond to um, in different ways. And the last thing I want to say is that moving away from that uh, definition, the way we define partition or the way partition literature has looked at um, partition, I think, as I said, my father's novel also ends on home. We have to give up what exactly we cannot forget what happened we cannot forget that violence just as african americans here in the united states because of the atrocities that are still committed against them continue to emphasize on slavery because that was the beginning point of the relationship sociological uh, writers point talk about the placement theory placement theory is that how a particular relationship begins at a, at a specific point so india and pakistan are rooted in that placement and that placement was steeped in violence, in displacement of people, in loss of humans, loss of jobs, loss of employment, loss of sanity. So we keep that there as a reminder, but we use that to create a new path forward for both the nations. That is how I see the future going. I would Sorry, like to, long answer. <laughs> I would like to butt in here. There are two things I want to say. Collective illusions are very dangerous. The collective illusion that overpowered the Hindus and the Sikhs and the Muslims on the other side, there, were, there are collective illusions on Palestine and uh, Israel. And uh, there are, I mean, I was a fervent, uh, supporter of Israel at one time, and now I have drifted to the other side, saying that the Israelis, Israelis are the aggressors and the Palestinians are the victims. So uh, the, the collective illusion where people are bombarded 
by the people in the church, in the synagogue, in the classrooms, that this is wrong with uh, our polity or our society is very, very dangerous. And India is also passing through this kind of very mild, very mild, uh, uh, what shall I say, uh, version of this particular collective illusion of victimization of other things. The second thing, as a law enforcement officer, uh, ex-officer, I was I had 15 years in the police. That's all. Is that if the Brits had stayed on, if they had not run away, things would have been okay. I mean, we have, I mean, all these cyclones come, or don't they? And thousands of people uh, run. They are cared for. They are cared for the police and the military and the state administration. The British could have done it if they had postponed the partition by one year. And that is what they have said in the June 3, uh, the June 3, this uh, declaration. And then they completely reneged on uh, July 4th with the previous one. I'm, I would like historians to go into this. They haven't gone into this aspect at all. Sorry, that's my intervention. I would, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, that is exactly the kind I would, of reaction. I would, I would like some, yeah, by Shish, I would like some questions from the audience. Absolutely, absolutely. We, we are on that point. Uh, so I open it now to every member who is on this online platform today with us, who has been uh, listening very patiently to the wonderful insights and arguments from our two speakers this evening. So I invite questions, comments. Uh, from uh, everybody here. Please go ahead. Please unmute yourself first and uh, then you can put your question. Yes, anybody wanting to ask a question, please? to either of our speakers this evening. I see some comments in the chat box, but. Uh... Yeah, there, there are comments. Um, let me see if there's a question. Uh, I know there is no, uh, actually there are, comments. Uh, thank you, uh, Darola sir, for highlighting such sensitive issues with the uh, same grace that I happened to uh, experience while getting that chance to interact with you for the first time while you were present there at the Calicut University campus in a program held by our Academy Society. And thank you, Anita ma'am, for uh, Exploring the way your father touched upon such sensitive issues with the needed amount of impossibility and humanity, which is really needed to deal with such issues as your father did in Azadi. Although I am not a uh, still, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot to the organizing team and also you are present today in this program. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions or comments? Any other questions and comments, please? Uh, oh, uh, okay. Uh, so we will uh, I, we will wind up for the evening, but uh, it has been a tremendous uh, eye opener, at least for me, and I'm sure for everyone who has been here this evening, hearing these two speakers, these two writers, hold forth on not only their own work, the work of uh, 
collective writing, the corpus of writing in India with regard to partition, but the issue itself, they've gone back and tackled it uh, through the uh, pathways of memory. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it has been a, a very uh, uh, grounding experience. You know, we, we talk about high theory all the time in academia. This has brought high theory down to the dust. And, and we have kind of uh, seen how uh, we can construct from the bottom up with regard. And perhaps the time has come to uh, take a, a fresh look. Um, KKG has already uh, asked uh, or requested uh, a, a, a kind of a, a, a revamping of uh, the historical perspective with regard to uh, partition, uh, the way that the role of the British especially and, and uh, the unprepared state in which they left in us Indians uh, in, in 1947. Uh, the, 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 the timeline that KKG has outlined, the, the, the almost absurd timeline that he has outlined and the, the way in which it suddenly changed and uh, it brought about uh, this, this carnage on both sides. So an absolutely unprepared population, an absolutely unprepared uh, you know, uh, system of, of administration and law, uh, you know, it took us several years to recover, even physically, from uh, the trauma of partition, from the actual excesses and, and violence of partition. So uh, it, it has been a, a, a tremendous evening of, of great uh, insight and learning for us, uh, of renewing our, our, our kind of commitment to partition, but in, in different ways, not just documentary, not just consigning it to the documentary bin and saying that, well, it was a very important thing in the past, but it's something in the past. It is very much with us every day. It is a way of seeing that the partition has fashioned a way of seeing uh, almost, which we can now take into the times that we are we are living through and the days forward. Because as KKG has warned us, uh, you know, collective illusion is a, is a very dangerous thing and we are living through uh, a, a very dangerous time in that sense. And uh, the insights drawn, the corollaries drawn from our experience of, of living through and uh, uh, embodying partition in works of art will stand us in good state, I'm sure. Uh, thank you very much, KKG, uh, for being with us this evening, of uh, sparing your va very valuable time for us. Thank you, Anita Ji, for joining us from far away United States uh, early in the morning and uh, giving us all these insights. Thank you, Dr. Kunda Nageshwara Rao, for organizing this platform. Thank you, Samuel, for being such a wonderful uh, technical help uh, on every occasion. Uh, I will now hand it over to Dr. Rao to you know, complete proceedings for today and uh, do the vote of thanks. Dr. Rao, it's over to you now. Yeah, uh, you have already made the vote of thanks. And again, it's time for uh, dinner. No, I, I've just thanked you. I've just thanked you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Debashish Lahi, for your wonderful concluding conclusion. And at the outset, uh, on behalf of Usman University Center for International Programs, OUCIP, uh, now it's OUCIS, Center for International Studies, uh, we are very thankful to Professor Keki Darwala Saab for your patient uh, attendance and all the way you are active. And we never think that you are 85 years old and the young scholars, they should take your living legend in the literature. I'm sure that we are very lucky that today we have attended a wonderful insights and wonderful experiences. In fact, the way you have given the examples, the life experiences, the moments that you had and the, the things that you have in your life and the readings and all. Thank you very much, sir. And my sincere thanks go to uh, Thank Professor you. Anita Nahal, ma'am. Ma'am, you were the father, I don't know, but one of my senior professors who retired, today he came to my office, Professor Karnakar, retired professor, and he was talking about uh, Chamar Nahal Saab. And sir has visited our university when Professor Malladi, sir, was the vice chancellor. Sir used to come to our university many times. And Sir has visited our ASRC many times. And when we look at the old books, the library books, we can find his name on the books. And many senior professors of our university uh, 
they have been referring uh, your uh, father's name. Thank you very much, ma'am. I am very lucky as the director of the center that uh, I am I am not able to see your father, but I can I am very blessed with your presence. The center where you CAP welcomes your presence, ma'am. And my sincere thanks to, goes goes to my scholarly friend, mm -hmm. Professor Devashish Lahri, the chairman, Inspiratory Arts Foundation, who has been a source of inspiration to many scholars across the country. And my sincere thanks to our mentor. Uh, uh, and senior academician in South India, I can say, Professor C. R. Visveshwar Ragaru joined the lecture from the USA. Thank you very much, sir. And my sincere thanks to all those who have spent that valuable time with us this evening and made this evening memorable. My thanks to Shamil Tickleton, coordinator of our center. And thank you all. Have a nice day. Certainly, these deliberations make us to know more about partition literature. Special thanks to Anita Nahal, ma'am. Thank you very much, Keki Darwala Sab. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank Have you. a nice Thank night. You so much. Thank you. Privilege. Thank you, Gopal, uh, Dr. Lahiri. And thank you, Dr. Nageshwar Rao. Thank you, everyone. Who listen patiently. Thank, thank you, you so much, uh, Anita ji. Have a good day. Good day thank to you. you. <laughs> good night. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you, Devachish. Thank you, Anita. And, and thank, you, uh, thank you, uh, uh, sir, Thank you so Anand. much again. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you and good night, everyone. Especially. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Larry and Gopal Larry. He's visiting the US. He joined the session. Very kind of you to do that from Atlanta. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anita, for this outstanding session. And thank you, Devachish. As usual, you are very, very good.